Okay guys, hello and welcome back to another video tutorial. So in this tutorial, I will be covering about the Dvujin sequence, which is actually a programming problem that appeared in one of the Google coding interviews. So without further ado, let's get started. So first, I'll just start with the reason why I decided to create this video. So the reason why I decided to create this video was because I found existing tutorials very convoluted, very confusing, right? They were pretty tough for me to understand. So I created this video so that you will be able to understand it a bit more better and so that uh, this particular problem will be a bit more accessible to the general audience. Yeah. So I'll kick off with the definition of the Dvujin sequence. So I actually copied this definition from Wikipedia. So in combinatorial mathematics, a Dvujin sequence of order n on size k of over a blah 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 in which every possible substring on A occurs exactly once as a substring as a contiguous subsequence and not as the joint, disjoint set of characters, blah blah blah. So, as you can see, it's pretty tough to understand the definition of Dvujin sequence, right? So, to illustrate what this sequence really is, I'm going to use a numerical concrete example. So, we'll use the case when n is equals to 2, okay? So, when n equals 2, right, if you go to the definition, right, we notice that uh, we're looking at every possible substring of length n okay so we're looking at every substring of length n so in this case right our n is equals to so meaning our substring will be of size 2 okay there will be two characters in a substring so first let's try to get this substring so this substring we can get this substring right 0 1 from this sequence of characters and it's a substring of size 2 Another substring of size 2 we can get, we can generate from this sequence of characters is this 1, 1, 1, 1. Another possible substring we can generate is 1, 0. And the last substring of size 2 we can generate from this sequence of characters is 0, 0. So, what do you notice about these substrings? Okay, the first thing that we notice, right, is that there are no duplicate substrings okay every substring is unique every substring is different from each other now let me give you an additional problem so given two slots and two digits how many numbers can you form okay so given two slots right so given that you have two slots so one slot two slot and you have two digits so in this case without loss of generality so let's say the two digits that you're given is zero and one so how many different numbers can you form well i can actually put zero in the first slot i can also put put one in the first slot and similarly, I can either put 0 or 1 in the second slot. So there are two possible numbers you can put in the first slot. There are two possible numbers that we can put in the second slot. And by the counting principle, we can just do 2 times 2, basic P and C. And we'll know that there are four possible numbers that we can generate, right? And the four numbers that we can generate, notice, is the same as the as all the substrings that we have generated from this sequence of characters. We can form 0, 1, we can form 1, 1, we can form 1, 0, or we can form 0, 0. So what you notice is that all the substring of size 2 that we can generate from this sequence of characters actually covers the entire range of combination of numbers that we can form when we have two slots and two digits. Okay, so that is a, that's a particular property of this particular sequence of characters, of the Dvujin sequence. So I'll use another example to illustrate. So at this time, I'll use n is equals to 3. And when n equals to 3, meaning we're trying to generate substrings, oops, substrings of size 3. Okay. So first, the first substring that we can generate of size 3 is 0, 0, 001. And I'll write it at the side. And lastly, 0, 0, 0. So we notice that there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. There are 8 possible substrings that we can generate from 
this sequence of characters and we notice the same thing here is that there are no duplicate substrings of size 3, right? Now let me give you a similar problem, right? Given 3 slots, so this time we have 3 slots instead of 2 slots and 2 digits so let's say the two digits without loss of generality are 0 and 1. How many numbers can you form? So we have three slots, 1, 2, 3, and you can use two digits. How many numbers can you form? Well, I can actually, I can either put 0 or 1 in the first slot. I can either put 0 or 1 in the second slot. And similarly, I can also put either 0 or 1 in the third slot. And because there are two combinations, there are two possibilities for each of the slots, by the counting principle, I know that there are two cube possible possibilities, which in this case is 8, which is similar to the number of substrings that we have generated from this sequence of characters. All the substrings generated actually cover the entire range of combinations that we can generate uh, with 3 slots and 2 digits. So that is essentially the beauty of debugging sequences. So I hope that actually gives you a primer into what debugging sequences are. So usually there are multiple solutions. So meaning there is another solution, there is another string that satisfies the conditions that I've actually said previously. So as an exercise, try to find another solution for n is equal to 2 and n equal to 3. See? So for this, try to find another sequence of characters for n equal to 2 and try to find another sequence of characters for n equal to 3. Additionally, I would like to add that the debugging sequences is not restricted to binary, it's not restricted to base 2. We can actually use base 3, base 4, all the way up to base 10. In fact, we can also use all the way up to base 36 if we include the alphabets A, B, C. As long as, so as long as we have sufficient characters, right, um, for each slot, it's actually fine. So I'll just illustrate with a quick example. So in base 3 and n equals to 2, so when we're looking at base 3, right, we're looking at base when k is equals to 3, and when n is equal to 2, we're looking at substrings of size 2. So let me just quickly generate. So the first substring we can generate is 0, 0, 7, 8, 9. So we generated 9 different substrings from this sequence of characters, and again, notice that we have no duplicate substrings. So again, if I give you an additional problem, so given, given two slots and three digits, so in this case, let's say the three digits are 0, 1, 2, how many numbers? So two slots, we can put, we can either put 0, 1 or 2 in the first one, we can also put either 0, 1 or 2 in the second one. So, three possibilities for the first, three possibilities for the second slot, and by the counting principle, there are nine possible combinations, which actually matches the number of substrings that we have generated from this sequence of characters. Okay, so we notice that the substrings that we the substrings that we actually generate is actually answer to this particular question here. Now, here comes the problem. How do we generate a D Bujin sequence of base K for size N? Okay, so, okay. So, meaning, when we're looking at base K, right, we are saying that we can either, we can use digits from 0, 1, 2, all the way up to K minus 1 inclusive. And when we're looking at substring of size N, well, if N is equal to 2, we're looking of substrings like 0, 0, 1, 1. So we want, we want to kind of generalize this to k and n, and is there an algorithm that actually allows us to do this? Well, it turns out there is. We can actually use graph theory. So essentially, we are trying to model this problem as a graph. So each node will represent each possible substring of size n. Okay, so if assuming let's say n is equal to 2, and k is equal to 2, meaning base k, we are using binary, 0 or 1. So um, the possible nodes are 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. So in total, there'll be four nodes for this uh, test case here. Okay. 
top edges will be established between node A and node B if the last n minus 1 digits in node A when appended with 0 all the way up to k minus 1 can be transformed into node B. So this might sound a little bit confusing but I will explain later. Lastly, once we have finished with our graph construction, so this part here is actually referred to as the graph construction. Okay, graph construction. So once we've, we have actually finished constructing the graph, we can actually use DFS to find a path that visits all nodes exactly once. And this is actually known as the Hamilton path. Okay, if you actually study graph theory, but you don't actually need to know this in order to proceed on the video. Okay, so first we start with 0, 0. So the case that we're looking at is n is equal to 2 and k is equal to 2, meaning we're looking to generate substrings of size 2 of base k. So meaning we can use digits 0 and 1 only. Okay. Now, following which, we're looking, reminder, we're looking at n equals to 2 and k is equal to 2. So if we go, actually go back to the uh, to our algorithm description, right, we actually see that edges will be established if the last n minus 1 digits in node A when appended with one character 0, 0, 1, 2, all the way up to k minus 1 can be transformed into node B. Okay, so reminder that n equals to 2 and k is equals to 2. So we take this existing node, let's call this node A, right? 0, 0, we take the last n minus 1 digit, so in this case, it will be the last digit, 0, and then we push back 0, okay? Because we can actually push back uh, 0 to 1, right? We can either push back 0 or 1. So we start with 0 first. 0, 0, and since 0, 0 is just itself, right? It doesn't really matter since we're trying to find a path that visits all nodes exactly once. The other possibility is that we can take 0 and then we push back 1. And because we can actually transform from 0, 0 to 0, 1, hence we can actually draw an edge from here, from 0, 0, to 0, 1. So in this case, this will be node B. So now we're looking at this node here. So 0, 1. Now, again, we take the last n minus 1 digits, which in this case is 1. So we take 1, and then we push back 0 first. And since we can actually transform from 0, 1 to 1, 0, hence we actually draw an edge from 0, 1 to 1, 0 which is represented by this arrow here. Again, we can take this 1 and then we append 1 to this. Hence, we can actually draw an edge from 0, 1 to 1, 1. Now that we have processed two nodes, we can actually choose to process either 1, 0 or 1, 1. But in this case, let's focus on 1, 1 first. So 1, 1, we take the last n minus 1 digits. So in this case, it's just the last digit. And then we try to append 0. So when we append 0, we actually generate this new node 1, 0. Hence, we actually draw an edge from 1, 1 to 1, 0. Now again, we take the last n minus 1 digit and then we push back 1. And since 1, 1 is just the same as this 1, 1, so it's the same as the original node, right? There's no point uh, creating a self cycle. So we can actually just ignore this node. Now, let's focus on node 1, 0. So we focus on this node. 1, 0. Again, we take the last n minus 1 digits, which is 0. So 0, and then we push back 0. And since we can transform from 1, 0 to 0, 0, we draw an edge from 1, 0 to 0, 0, which is represented by this arrow over here. Now, let's take 0, and then we push back 1. So we can transform from 1, 0 to 0, 1. Hence, we draw an edge from 1, 0 to 0, 1, which is represented by this edge over here, this arrow over here. And we are done. So we are done with our graph construction. So this will be our final graph. And now, it's the time to use DFS to find the Hamilton path, i.e. the path that visits all nodes exactly once. So assuming that we start at 0, 0, a possible path could be 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, and 1, 0. So, so at this point, we have visited every single node in the graph. Hence, we can actually stop here. So this is one possible Hamilton path. The concatenated string is this thing. 
So what do I mean by the concatenated string? Well, if we follow the path that we've actually constructed, right, we actually start at 0, 0. The next node that we visit is 0, 1, following which is 1, 1. And lastly, the last node that we visit is 1, 0. So if we, if we were to actually combine all these nodes together into one big string, we actually get 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, which is the concatenated string over here. A key observation that you need to make is that because we always use previous n minus 1 digits to compute the new node, we need to get rid of n minus 1 adjacent digits kn minus 1 times. So this might sound a little bit confusing, but don't worry, I will guide you through. Okay, so how do we get from con concatenated string to the final string? So again, if we were to follow the Hamilton path that we've actually found, right, we start with 0, 0, and then the next node that we visit is 0, 1, 1, 1, and the last node that we visit is 1, 0. So because we start at 0, 0, right, the next node that we are looking at is 0, 1. And we notice that this 0 from 0, 1 is borrowed from the previous node. It's actually the same 0 as this. It's the same 0 from the previous node. So meaning this 0 is duplicate, right? We always reuse the previous n minus 1 digits to compute the new node. If you actually notice this uh, in the algorithm. So what we need to do is that get rid of this 0. Similarly, if you look at 1, 1, right? This 1 is actually borrowed from this 1. Hence, we can actually cancel this because it's actually reused from the previous node. And in the same logic, this one is the same one as this. It's actually borrowed, it's actually reused from this node here. So what you can do is we can get rid of this one as well. After cancelling all the duplicate characters, when we combine the final string together, we get 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. And this is how we actually get the final string from the concatenated string. Lastly, I want to talk about the algorithm, the code, the DFS code, that is responsible for generating the debugging sequence. So first this n and k, okay, where n is the substring size and k is the base k. So total will actually give us the number of combinations possible. And in this case, uh, so it's not n to the power of k, instead it's k to the power of n. And string final ants will actually store the final debugging sequence. And finally, we have a visited array, which will actually help us keep track of which nodes have been visited. Counter will help us keep track of how many nodes have been visited. Now, if counter is equal to total, okay, if counter is equal to total, meaning at this point, we have visited every node. So meaning we have a Hamilton path available. So once we have a Hamilton, Hamilton path available, right, we can actually use this particular algorithm that I've talked to you about. We are actually getting rid of the duplicate digits to get the final string from the concatenated string. So it's basically this algorithm that I, I've described to you earlier. So obviously there's a more succinct, there's a more concise way of writing it, but it gets the job done. And I don't wish to elaborate too much on this because I mainly want to focus on explaining the DFS portion. Okay, so this part here is where we actually do the DFS exploration of the graph. So first we use a for loop because a base k, right, when we're, when we're operating in base k, we're actually using digits 0, 1, all the way up to k minus 1 inclusive. Hence, we actually use a for loop and we stop the loop the moment that i is lesser than k. Next, this here is actually a C++ or maybe it's a C trick to convert an integer literal to a character literal. Now, this is where we actually reuse the last n minus 1 digits from the previous node. So in this case, let's say that the previous node was x, y, z, right? So because strings are zero index, we start at 0, 1, 2. Hence, when we do substring 1, we're actually getting the substring of y, z. We're getting from the index 1 and all the way to the end. So in this case, we're getting y, z. And once we get y, z, this will actually be stored in a new node variable. And from yz, we actually push back one of these new characters that we get. So either 0, 1, all the way up to k minus 1. And this is actually how we compute the new node. Following which, we, co we convert this to an uh, integer. Okay, so we convert this because this new node, right, is in a string. It's a string data type. So what we do is that we actually make use of the store function to convert this string into an integer variable. And the reason why we actually convert this to an integer variable is so that we can put 
in our visited array so that you can keep track of which nodes have been visited to, vi to avoid visiting duplicate nodes. So if we have visited this node, particular node before, okay, we actually skip this node and we continue exploring other nodes. Else, if we have not visited this node, we mark this node as visited by setting this equal to one. And finally, we increase the counter because the number of nodes that we have visited have increased by one. Now, we, go, we compute the new ANS. So remember how the concatenated string, right? We are, we simply, we start with zero, zero, and then we push back zero, one. So we start at zero, zero, right? And then the next node that we visit is zero, one. So we just push back. And then the next node that we visit is one, one. So we just push back. And the last node that we visit is one zero. So essentially, just keep pushing back the node that we have visit to the to this string here. And this is the string that will uh, essentially keep track of whatever nodes have been visited. From this, we can actually compute the final uh, string using this particular uh, algorithm. So, okay, so essentially, we're just going to keep adding whatever nodes we have visited into this big answer string. Finally, we do the final DFS, and after we have explore this particular node we actually do some backtracking okay so essentially so let's say we have node a b c we start at a right and then we traverse to b and after we have finished exploring b we backtrack back to a and because we backtrack to to a right b at this point is not visited and because b at this point is not visited we can actually set this back to zero back to our initial state and we can also decrement the counter because b is not visited right so the number of nodes that has to be visited has to decrease by one yeah so i hope that actually kind of clarifies any some of your queries about debugging sequences and if you have any queries do feel free to leave down in the comments below and yeah i'll see you guys next time